First of all, thank you very much indeed, Tim and the, the organisers, for in inviting me along today. Uh, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak to you all today. Um, I feel a, a bit like an imposter, but some of you will know that um, I am I'm not of a religious background at all. And suppose I have appeared in the media quite often over the years, maybe in debate against some of you in the room, and I apologise in advance. <laughs> um, but this. This is a, a wonderful opportunity for um, a little bit of togetherness uh, between the secularist and the Christians because I think we are facing the same dilemma. We don't understand what the hell is going on. You know, and as a secularist, I suppose I was always of the view that we need to separate church from state. But of course, we now need to ch uh, separate church from state for an entirely different reason, you know, because we're in a situation where there's a severe uh, likelihood that the state is going to do try to do down the church, to stifle freedom of speech of the church, uh, to stifle the freedom of association of church members and Christians. And I have always, as a secularist, been a firm believer in religious freedom, and I will do everything, everything in my power to ensure that you maintain that religious freedom going forward because the situation we're in is utterly, utterly disgraceful. I also sh uh, should really start with a confession. I used to be, my, my family were um, uh, certainly church attenders when I was uh, uh, relatively young. Uh, I used to go to Sunday school and, and attend church, uh, mostly the evening service with my grandmother. You know, I would get brownie points by uh, attending the evening service, but I was also invo involved in the Church Lads Brigade of uh, Christ Church Lisburn, uh, uh, Church of Ireland Church. And the, the, the Church Lads Brigade had a very shiny cup. And I always wanted to get, it was a scripture cup. And in order to win the script, scripture cup, you had to prove that you knew the scriptures. And they set a test. Uh, but I, and I really desperately wanted this big shiny cup for the house. So I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll sit beside this guy called David Bell, uh, because he was really into his scriptures. And I knew that if I copied him, I would almost certainly score very well. And miraculously, as a result of copying David Bell's answers, I obviously had one answer that he didn't have the answer to. And I won. I won the scripture cup. But obviously this was as a result of very, very devious means and I won that scripture cup and never confessed that in fact I had copied David Bell. And by the way, David Bell is, is now um, a religious minister in the uh, Church of Ireland. He's not here today, is he? No. Might be. The, the reason I tell, that, well, first of all, I've confessed now, so if you do see David, just let him know that, uh, that I've made the confession. Uh, but. I, I mention that uh, for a very simple reason. Obviously, we have a number of codified processes in society. We know that really we shouldn't copy people if we're sitting in an examination. Uh, and, and often what we do is we use, uh, and in fact, just last week in London, we had a debate on the whole issue of, of digital IDs. And, and Bob Moran, the cartoonist that m many of you will know from the, the Daily Telegraph, who was sacked because of his position on COVID-19, uh, he made this point that so much of what we do and how we behave in society is codified by this uh, interpersonal relationship that we have with individuals. You know, it's all done on a handshake or a nod or a wink or a facial expression, and it seems to work miraculously. You know, the reason we drive on the left-hand side of the road and, uh, and keep that consistent is that, well, it, it just makes driving a lot easier. And we, we take on trust the fact that people are not going to be driving on the wrong side of the road. It doesn't require any contract or any law or, well, there are regulations, but it doesn't require us to understand them or, or read them permanently to be able to drive on the correct side of the, ro of the road. And this is all about trust and natural law. And uh, laws tend to emerge. Um, some of them uh, emerge as a result of that Judeo-Christian tradition as well that we've been, we, we've been dis uh, discussing today as well. And obviously a lot of these relationships, these trust contracts that we come up with are based uh, on, as I say, a nod and a wink and, and a, f a, a human relationship. But that is made a lot more difficult, obviously, when the faces, the faces of those human beings are covered in a a piece of sputum-filled cloth. 
And when some of those fundamental laws are challenged, it results in protests. And last week I had the privilege of standing at the City Hall uh, with about probably four or five thousand other people at, at the front of City Hall, but we blocked the traffic. Uh, and they, they stood, there was a few speeches, but frankly I couldn't hear them. But it was actually more poignant to stand with those four or five thousand people who were saying very little, maybe having side conversations, maybe being delighted at meeting other people who had similar views and thought that this was abhorrent. And, and when I was there, I, I, I thought, well, I'm going to have to speak at this event next week. What, what should be the kind of structure of, the, of, of this, this talk in relation to those natural laws? And what's the best representation of this idea of, of law, of good law, and bad law, laws that are imposed from on high by the state. And I, I immediately thought of Martin Luther King's um, letter from Birmingham jail. And he wrote this letter when he was incarcerated in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, when he was on a protest march. And the protest march was banned by the state and he was incarcerated. And he felt this was a good opportunity for him to write a letter to the church leaders of the South. And he wrote the letter on the 16th of April, 1963. And the purpose of the letter really, and if you get the opportunity to read, many, many of you probably already have, but the letter was invoking some support, invoking support from fellow Christians who really weren't giving him much support. And the speech had several key themes. The, the first theme was the need for protest to protest against bad law, as he saw, saw it. He outlawed the nature of the isolation and separatism of, of the Negro, as he called it in the letter, in the, in, the, uh, in the long letter that he wrote from prison. And, and also he reflected very much on the nature of law and God's law versus the law of the state. And he also, as I mentioned, requested that all Christians support the plight of the Negro. And this is what he said, though, in the context of the letter, because it is all very apposite for the conversation that we're having today. He said, we should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal, and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, I am sure that had I lived in Germany at the time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. If today I lived in a communist country where certain principles dear to the Christian faith are suppressed, I would openly advocate disobeying that country's anti-religious laws. And of course, we only need to think today about the Chinese Communist Party. Obviously, um, Martin Luther King was thinking of, um, of, the, of the Soviet communism, but today it's the Chinese Communist Party and it seems to be absolute, absolutely everywhere and seems to be defining the law of what is supposed to be one of the greatest pluralist democracies on earth, namely the United Kingdom. I also recently had a, a spat with uh, Billy Bragg um, on Twitter. And Billy Bragg has decided that he's, uh, for those of you who don't know, he was a left, he, he had his heyday in the 19. 80s were really writing protest songs against Thatcherism and saying that, uh, that Thatcher was uh, fundamentally and morally repugnant because she didn't uh, agree with the idea of society. And yet Billy Bragg has deemed it appropriate to ban people who aren't willing to show vaccine passports at his gigs. And he does this on the justification that they are in some way morally reprehensible, the unvaccinated, because they're not contributing uh, to society. And we see how ridiculous that is, given some of the talks we've heard today. But it's the people from the left who supposedly are defending human rights that are doing absolutely nothing about this, but in fact are imposing the government strictures on the population. The people of the left are not rebelling as they should be. So therefore it is a battle between society as it is constituted by Billy Bragg and the left and the individual, the individual who has free thought, 
the individual who is prepared to go out and research and see that this is wrong. Individuals like Christ, like Martin Luther King, and those are the upholders of good law. Good law. Relationships between people, relationships coming about as a result of fellowship. Martin Luther King and obviously Christ paid the ultimate price uh, in upholding good law and not permitting the imposition of bad law, even if, this, even if it meant ultimately that they should pay the price of, of their lives. And many of you may have studied uh, at school uh, Murder in the Cathedral by T.S. Eliot. And there's a wonderful speech in, in, in the play where, where uh, Thomas Beckett defines the true definition of a martyr. A martyr is he who has become the instrument of God, who has lost his will in the will of God, and who no longer desires anything for himself, not even the glory of being a martyr. And the fact is that centrally controlled digital IDs are the means by which bad law can be enforced. Digital IDs will result in segregation. Digital IDs will result in apartheid. Digital IDs will result in ghettoization, isolation, social opprobrium for people who say, I disagree. The Jews are rats. They spread typhus. This was, this was a poster that was used in the ghettos in Poland. Yeah? They're like lice. They spread typhus. And this is, the, this is what is beginning to happen. It's already happening in Austria. It's happening in, in Australia. Who would have thought that people in the Northern Territories would be put into military trucks and taken away because they might have been in contact with somebody who was unvaccinated. This is against all good human law and human decency. And we must do absolutely everything we can do to stop this happening. Now the history of digital passports in the United Kingdom uh, it's, there's, it, there are, the government is, is littered with failed digital ID proje uh, projects. You know, when Tony Blair tried to implement them uh, in, uh, in his last administration and the Conservative Lib Dem coalition scrapped them in 2010. Uh, Tony Blair has continued his crusade and he's now joined by a number of supranational organisations many of which have been funded by the Gates Foundation. Uh, the World Economic Forum is at the forefront, quite the most abhorrent organization that has ever, ever pronounced on how we should live our lives. Um, and of course, the Gates Foundation also funds primarily the World Health Organization. The Gates Foundation funds many of the organizations that issued all of the projections about the growth of COVID in the United Kingdom, such as Imperial College, and of course, even the BBC. Now, conservatives have rejected these things, but now we have a kind of con-socialist government in the United Kingdom, a government that is implementing the laws of communism, a government that has implemented lockdown policies, a government that wants to implement digital identity, a government that has launched so many consultations and is now using its devolved administrations as kind of trial subjects to determine whether these things can be rolled out and whether they can get away with it. I think we have to say they're not going to get away with it. We're not going to obey them. We're not going to use them. We're not going to show papers to get into a coffee shop or a restaurant or a pub. <laughs> Uh, Liz did a brilliant job in terms of outlining some of the reasons why we can't do these things. And there is a sort of beautiful, prosaic quality about some of these uh, conventions. The UNESCO Declaration of Bioethics. Any preventive, diagnostic and therapeutic medical intervention is only to be carried out with the prior, free and informed consent of the person concerned based on adequate information. The consent should, where appropriate, 
be expressed and may be withdrawn by the person concerned at any time and for any reason without disadvantage or prejudice. These are the most fundamental human rights. They are fundamental human rights won by us and typically at the forefront of those campaigns, those demands for human rights have been Christians. And we can't give up now. We cannot let the government ignore the fact that it is a signatory of the UNESCO declaration that includes Article 6, which I've just read to you. There's another thing that they can do with, uh, with digital passports, and this is one that's not so well known. They can take your money. They can take your money away. Because if you need a digital identity to be able to enter a restaurant or a pub, it may just be that you need a digital identity to access your own money. And it's really, really concerning that as the central bank of the United Kingdom is now investigating the creation of a so-called central bank digital currency. Now, this is the same central bank that has overseen UK sovereign debt reaching the levels of 2.4 trillion pounds. 2.4 trillion, this is never going to be repaid. Much of this debt is owned to China. Uh, much of this debt has, uh, been, uh, has been incurred by the government to prop up lame duck businesses. And very little of it actually has gone to the, the entrepreneur, the small business person, the small business owners whose uh, businesses have been utterly destroyed over the last 21 months. And yet these central banks are now proposing that they're going to manage our money and that we'll only get access to them if we obey, if we build up sufficient social credit. And, and again, if we allow the digital IDs to come in, the likelihood is that we will see the emergence of central bank digital currencies and we can't let that happen. But I want to return to the letter from Birmingham Jail. And when I read this short passage from that letter, I want, to, I want you to think of those who oppose these disgraceful restrictions. Lockdowns, forced vaccinations, social isolation, church closures. People who believe, as I do, that we are on the slippery slope towards total state control of our lives. Think of the protesters who were there in Belfast last week, or Rome, or Melbourne, typically labelled anti-vaxxers. And then consider these words from Dr King when he wrote to the church leaders in Alabama and Georgia. I wish you had commended the Negro sit-inners and demonstrators of Birmingham for their sublime courage, their willingness to suffer and their amazing discipline in the midst of great provocation. One day the South will recognize its real heroes. They will be James Merediths with a noble sense of purpose that enables them to face jeering and hostile mobs and with the agonizing loneliness that characterizes the life of the pioneer. They will be old, oppressed, battered Negro women symbolized in a 72-year-old woman in Montgomery, Alabama, who rose up with a sense of dignity and with her people decided not to ride segregated buses, and who responded with ungrammatical profundity to one who inquired, inquired about her weariness. My feet is tired, but my soul is at rest. They will be the young high school and college students, the young ministers of the gospel and a host of their elders courageously and non-violently sitting at lunch counters and willingly going to jail for conscience own sake. One day the South will know that when these disinherited children of God sat down at lunch counters, they were in reality standing up for what is best in the American dream and for the most sacred values of our Judeo-Christian heritage, thereby bringing our nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the Founding Fathers in their formulation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. We have the power to stop this. We need to make clear that we stand together, those of faith and those of none, 
and our belief, our common belief in our humanity and our trust in the primacy of good law or even God's law and treat all as equal. We need to assert that segregation and apartheid is fundamentally wrong when based on spurious claims and propaganda. And we must not succumb to a, a papers-based society or a, smart, a smartphone-based app that's required us to allow, uh, allow us to be active citizens and gain the services we pay for. The free thinkers are the new oppressed. Christians were denied entry to their churches because of jumped up bad laws, denied freedom to worship, freedom to meet, freedom to remember the ultimate sacrifice of Christ. We must say no to digital IDs. They are bad. It's time to say so firmly, peacefully. They must never be implemented in Birmingham or Belfast. Thank you very much.